Hello and welcome to Design Education Talk from the New Art School. Our guest today is Stephen Heller. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, how are you? I'm great, I'm great. How are you? Fantastic to have you here. It's nice to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. So, I mean, you have a lot of work, so <laughs> tell us about you and your work. Well, I am the uh, co-chair of the MFA Design as Entrepreneur Department the School of Visual Arts. I founded it 27 years ago with Lita Tellerico. And in fact, this summer, we're stepping down after 27 years um, and entering another stage of professional life, I hope. Uh, I've authored or edited uh, over 200 books and have written articles for scores of publications, both design-oriented and uh, mainstream. I was art director for the New York Times book review and op-ed page for the book review for 30 years, for the op-ed page three years, and I was a senior art director at the New York Times, uh, where I also wrote columns uh, visual column, uh, campaign stops, a column about graphics during the uh, Obama election. Um, I write or wrote obituaries of designers, maybe 63 designers. I was called the angel of death uh, because I'd always get a call from somebody saying someone was very ill or passed away and I would have to jump to the occasion and uh, write a news story about them. Um, I have a memoir that came out in 2022 called Growing Up Underground, a Counterculture, uh, I forget the subtitle, mm -hmm. uh, Counterculture in New York City. And uh, I'm a very inquisitive character. I have always loved history. I love teaching history. I love writing history. I love learning history. And the niche I found in which to situate my passions is design and more specifically graphic design and how it operates in the world and how it's been influenced and influence uh, people uh, and things and institutions. And, uh, you know, in, in its distilled sense, it's how uh, I'm interested in the creative process uh, particularly as it relates to graphic design. Wonderful, wonderful. So how did you get into teaching? Well, teaching came as a kind of side, unexpected surprise. I uh, was attempting to get out of the U.S. draft during the Vietnam War, and I had gone as an English major to New York University, and during that time, I stumbled into uh, working for an underground newspaper called the New York Free Press, and I liked it so much. I would go there every day and forfeit my school time. Um, one of the papers that we published out of the Free Press office was something called Screw, which was a sex review. And it was the first newsstand sex review of its kind. It was as much political as it was... Uh, it was certainly not erotic, but it was as much political as it was tawdry. And uh, I did a comic strip in there, and I 
used my philosophy professor as the lead of the gag. And uh, somehow it got back to the administration at NYU. And long story short, they said either I have to go into uh, psychotherapy with one of their therapists or they would ask me to leave. And I chose to leave. And I went to the School of Visual Arts to further maintain my uh, draft qualification or disqualification. Mm. And uh, I never went to classes there either. So uh, the chairman of the department, which was illustration and cartooning, Marshall Arisman, who died a couple of years ago, and today actually is the anniversary of his death, two years. Um, he had to kick me out. And the next year he hired me as a teacher. Wow. That's how I started as t teaching. Then I got my job at the New York Times. I stopped teaching for a year and Marshall started an MFA program in illustration called the illustrator as visual journalist. And I taught there for 14 years, uh, illustration history. And uh, that led to doing other things at the School of Visual Arts, conferences, symposia. And the chairman of the board at that time, Silas Rhodes, took a liking to me. And uh, he asked me if I would conceive of a graduate program in design, which SVA did not have. And I came up with one that was fitting the parameters of SVA as a professional school. And uh, it was the designer as entrepreneur. And that's now 27 years, as I said. Um, and it's still going strong. But in total, you've taught for how many years? In total, I think I've taught for over 40 years. Wow. Wow. And what has changed? in those 40 years? Well, aside from technology changing everything, uh, which is kind of redundant to talk about since everybody knows it, demographics have changed radically. Uh, School of Visual Arts is, like many art institutes and colleges in the U.S., have an influx of non-American students. And at first it was a problem because of language distinctions, difficulties. And then language became less of a barrier. Uh, students started coming earlier to study in uh, the United States. So they got high school and undergraduate college educations and therefore English became much more natural for them. And uh, in the past decade or so, um, the foreign population has outnumbered the Native American population. And they've brought a considerable amount of intelligence and talent to this uh, country. So I'd say design, particularly graphic design, has not changed so much stylistically, but conceptually. Uh, and the contribution of people from India, Turkey, um, China, Taiwan, Korea, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, these have all been extremely productive collaborations. Uh, we get less students from Europe, although we do get one or two a year in my program, um, because 
this is an expensive institution. And uh, foreign students don't get financial aid when they come to the U.S. Wonderful. What has changed in your teaching during this period? What, how has your teaching changed? Well, I never thought of myself as a teacher hmm. because I don't have anything, any specific skill to teach. I do teach a writing program writing course at a program I co-founded called uh, MA Decrit Design Criticism, which is now uh, writing research and criticism. And uh, there I teach research skills. I had a class called No Google. And uh, we've been talking about perhaps having a class called No AI. <laughs> um, but in terms of the MFA design program, um, I started teaching history in a linear fashion. And it was mostly Western Eurocentric. And that has changed. It's, it's had to become more inclusive as we find marginalized designers mm. uh, flowing to the top of the, to the pond. Um, and this year, I specifically had a, a program, a class devoted exclusively to propaganda since we're bombarded with it daily. And you could say that almost everything is propagandistic, uh, as in propagating or selling a message or an idea or a thing. And next uh, semester, I hope to be teaching, which I've already started in a pilot program, uh, Branding Democracy. Uh, and I'm looking for all points of view on democracy. I mean, there are some people who don't believe in it. Hmm. And how you translate that into a graphic uh, campaign or image is going to be very challenging. So tell us a bit more about the content of, of your of your. This is very exciting about the, no Google and no AI. And tell us about more about about your classes. Well, no Google was a class that the students had to do a research project on an object, an object of their choosing, anything, because everything is design. Everything has a design component, can be seen through a design lens. And they had to make choices of what they were going to do and then find that object and develop a story around it, a narrative. It could be the history of the object or it could be something else. And they could not use Google as a database for finding these clues or pathways. Um, they had to do interviews. They had to do gumshoe work, get on the sidewalk and walk around and talk to people. And um, it was fascinating because some of the people took it very literally and got an object and did their historical research by going to the library and talking to whoever. Uh, and then they came back with a written report that they had to present. Everything requires presentation. Mm. Um, so they had to write a script, essentially. Um, but there were some things that people selected that had no historical roots, or at least none that they could find easily 
in the amount of time they were given. So they found alternative entry points. One of the ones that was my favorite was a hairnet from the 30s. It was wrapped on this around this circular piece of cardboard and there was a logo. It looked like a record, an LP record. And, and the name of the company was there. And she looked up the name of the company in the library, in the stacks. And she found that there was a backstory to the company that was fascinating. Um, the owner of the company was very wealthy and there was a crime that was committed that cost him uh, his life, I think. He was murdered. So she told the story of the hairnet through that murder. And it's just a way of showing the students that you can start out with one idea or one goal and you'll get sidetracked by others. Hmm. You know, learning is a branching tree and it branches stretch in all directions. So it's just as interesting to find out who made something as to what was made. That's fascinating. How do you feel your experience as a designer and an author influence the way, the way you teach? Well, I often teach what I'm working on as a book mm -hmm. or an article because I've collected information and information is free floating. It can attach itself to any platform. Um, And teaching gives me a way to check out some of the f s uh, theories that I have. Um, in addition to that, uh, like with this pilot class on branding democracy, after we looked through the work that we we're supposed to be talking about and doing, uh, we had different, we had a, I raised a question about democracy as a concept and different people had different views of what was necessary for a democracy to exist, which did not necessarily follow the traditional uh, roots. And so <clears throat> I'm looking forward to that particular program as becoming uh, a larger event, a larger exploration of democracy through the visual lens, through a graphic design lens on any platform, any media, and maybe ultimately making a book out of it. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And what do you what do you think that um, are the challenges of of the students today? Challenge of the student is uh, to learn a lot and to kind of navigate the technologies that are at their disposal. Mm. Uh, we never called our program graphic design. We called it design because graphic design seemed like an antiquated term. Mm -hmm. And while typography is still the lingua franca of our aspect of design, um, it's not the totality of it. Uh, but just speaking about typography, uh, there are so many designers now who are creating their own languages and their own vessels for language, mm -hmm. uh, that it's challenging to do something original. So you're saying that the biggest challenge of students today is for them to create something original? To 
appreciate what originality is, mm. Mm. even if they don't, you know, uh, I've used this quote before. Paul Rand once said, being good is hard enough. Yeah. You don't have to be original. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Do you feel that that's linked to authenticity? Well, authenticity is a word that gets thrown around a lot now. Mm. You know, what is authentic as opposed to artificial? Artificial intelligence is alternative intelligence. Authenticity is could be ownership as a definition. Mm. But but do you feel that the students are reluctant to be more of their authentic self? Uh, in order for them to be more employable? Well, that is sometimes the case. But I think ultimately the students that I am in contact with want to be employable and at the same time be expressive. Mm, that's so that's wonderful. So whether you call that authenticity or personal voice or style... Uh, it covers all of those categories. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's it's fantastic to be around those students. Do you? How do you feel? Um, you mentioned fees. Um, how do you feel fees being a barrier to to education? Fees. You mentioned the expense. You mentioned the charges of the school. Oh, the school the expensive school. Yeah, I think it, it's a barrier to any education. But it's, you know, it, it's hard to pay for one's education because it goes up into the six figures sometimes. Um, but there are schools that give generous uh, scholarships, mm. and that's terrific. Um President Biden has decreased the number of loans that are still due, student loans, and that's important. But money is always a challenge. Uh, getting Going to school for two and a half years or two years, you don't necessarily have the chance to earn an income. School is an investment, and like any investment, they warn you that investing can be, result in loss. Mm. And uh, hopefully most students do not experience that loss. They experience gain, and even if they don't go into the field that they've studied, they have a basis for some other virtue or rigor that will come in handy. Absolutely. This design study tends to, tends to give those transferable skills. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but if you had no limitation, how would, you, how would you design the ideal school? If I had no limitation... To create a school that, that is the ideal place, the ideal school for teaching students, what, what would you do? I would have a integrated school where all the disciplines that you can name that fall under the rubrics of graphic design, product design, interaction design, innovation design, branding design, come together as one. And technology would be brought in and science would be brought in and history and writing would be part of it. And it would go for, it would be like a bridge between undergraduate and graduate and then postgraduate work. And it would be free. So having no limitations 
implies creating limitations. Uh, if the no limitation to me means your financial worries are not an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's a matter of creating customized courses for students that play to their talents and skills and being very rigorous with them and not allowing them to uh, not practice, so to speak. You know, if you're playing the piano, and this was true in my youth, uh, my parents bought a piano, I got piano lessons, uh, the teacher would come once a week. I never got past chopsticks in seven years. I just wouldn't practice. I'd make believe I was practicing. And I learned a big lesson from that, that if you don't practice, you don't learn. That's wonderful. Absolutely. 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 Music, I mean, having been a musician myself, uh, music uh, teaches that. Um, because it's very clear yeah. about the level. It's really clear about the level. Uh, I used to be a violinist. So it's very clear the level you're in according to what you've practiced. And there's a direct connection to design education for that. Yeah. So what other limitations would you, would you create? Well, I would create marketplace limitations. You know, there are certain things that even in the entrepreneur program we have, it's not blue sky. Uh, the ventures, as we call the thesis, um, are individual desires to create product or campaign or whatever, uh, but they're prescribed by business and how something can be sustainable, how it fits into the pattern of growth. There are, nobody is allowed to be totally free from responsibility. And just in the general sense, the limitation would be your responsibility to the audience, to the marketplace, to the producer, uh, to the society. Do you feel that the students need to do uh, both commercial and non-commercial work? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's good to do non-commercial work just to see where, how far you can go. And very often that non-commercial work becomes commercial. Absolutely. Absolutely. By virtue of their... Uh, their wherewithal. Um, but I think doing work for yourself doesn't necessarily mean it's not commercial. Of course, of course, but without, of course, what are the pressures of that? Because, I mean, students, do you think students can find the time to do both? Or the anxieties of, of, um, of achievement, of making it, are... are, are too much right now? Well, it depends on the student. Mm. But I think if you make it, uh, sanction it, uh, and make it part of the curriculum, uh, that personal work isn't just, you know, slapping paint on a canvas and saying it's expressionist, uh, but has some guidelines for its existence uh, that can be very wholesome in the sense of eventually m most designers I know have done personal things that have become their art. 
Mm, exactly. Or become their business. Mm. Uh, so they're going to get around to it anyway, so they might as well start early. Absolutely. What would be your advice to, to, to students? My advice to students is basically keep doing what you're doing and keep learning what you're learning. Uh, and accept criticism uh, by determining what is valuable and what is extraneous. And keep thinking. Hmm. Wonderful. What would be your advice to the educators? Well, the educators were once students, most of them. I wasn't, but most of them are. And I think the educators should follow the, the same principle. Uh, you know, there are a lot of programs that are already constructed that have requirements. And you get stuck into a program like typography one, layout one, layout two, layout three. Um, even in those, make sure there's enough chance for experimentation. And I'm hesitant to give advice to the teachers because every teacher comes to the table with a different perspective and a different agenda. And as a chair of a department. Uh, we know what we want in general form. We want a syllabus so that we know what they're uh, planning on doing, but a lot of it is improvisation. You know, you, you go with the flow of the class. Uh, it's like what they say about the Larry David Curb Your Enthusiasm show. They never had a script. They only had an outline. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to, to, to add to our conversation? No. I mean, this is, as I say, the last uh, hurrah for me and my co-chair uh, in this context. Um, I'm going to teach a little bit more. Um, but the technology, particularly the AI possibilities, are so varied that uh, they're beyond my grasp. And new blood is always necessary. Absolutely. I mean, is AI already effect affecting uh, the workflow and, and education? In some cases, it's affecting the workflow. In some cases, it's just this specter. Uh, so it, instead of workflow issues, it's ethical issues that are discussed. And what do you think will change because of it? Well, I've unfortunately looked at the downside of it. Mm -hmm. And that is, with ChatGPT, everybody who has to write, uh, if they start with ChatGPT, they've got a structure already. And I think you have to find your own structure. But... As I said, I'm kind of a, a an old man when it comes to this, and the younger students will probably figure out how to use it just as they figured out how to use Photoshop. Hmm. Yeah, but the, the thing is, Photoshop uh, doesn't have an opinion. Where ChatGPT seems to have a, seems to have an opinion about things. It does, but you know, so do teachers or so do masters. You copy the masters. Mm -hmm. uh, 
GPT scrapes the masters. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. It was, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>